Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AMR Action Podcast. My name is Danny Peters, Senior Advisor to the Canadian Antimicrobial Innovation Coalition. I am very pleased to welcome our guest today, Senator Mohamed Ravalia, who will speak to us from the perspective of a physician and a parliamentarian regarding Canada's role in combating antimicrobial resistance. Senator Ravalia was appointed to the Senate upon the recommendation of Prime Minister Trudeau in 2018, and he represents the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. He is a respected physician, medical educator. He has received a number of awards, including the Order of Canada, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, Canada Canadian Family Physician of the Year, and several community teaching awards. So I would say, Senator Valley, you're very well qualified to have this discussion, both as a physician who treats patients with antimicrobial resistant infections, and as a parliamentarian who walks the halls of influence in Ottawa. Um, I would say when it comes to solving the issues associated with AMR, we speak a lot about progress. And on one hand, it's scientific progress. We need those innovations, um, antimicrobials, diagnostics, and whatnot to address the growth of antimicrobial resistance. But we also talk about progress in terms of leadership and public policy. And that's why I'm so excited to have this discussion today. So I'm going to go into our questions. Senator Valia, thank you so much. Um, thank you. So you bring so much valuable experience to the Senate with your years of practicing and teaching medicine in Newfoundland and Labrador. And given that AMR has become a more significant issue over time, as you have likely have seen, uh, how has this impacted your work in treating patients in Newfoundland? Well, thank you very much for having me abroad and uh, good day to everyone who's listening. Uh, obviously, over the course of my practice, the increased availability of antibiotics pose significant challenges in patient care, including the risk of misuse of the newer broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, and a case in point is, you know, was the availability of the quinolones, for example, mm -hmm. when ciprofloxacin became available and was, uh, in, in a sense, uh, readily available, it became a first line treatment for urinary tract infections. And in a very short period of time, the resistance patterns for ciprofloxacin became dramatic, uh, up to the point of between 40 and 50% of individuals being resistant to, to it. So, you know, this was uh, particularly disconcerting. Uh, furthermore, and, and this is uh, stems from the rural-urban divide, uh, practicing in a rural community where ready access to diagnostics and rapid testing is an issue, uh, the path of least resistance often can be prescribing an antibiotic. So uh, I, I witnessed an increased resistance to first-line antibiotics, particularly in your uh, upper respiratory tract infections, uh, superficial skin infections, and of course, urinary tract infections. I think, you know, this kind of makes us realize that we need more nuance and a strategic approach to ensure that patients have access to effective treatments while avoiding further contribution to AMR and the need for heightened vigilance in prescribing antibiotics and managing resistant infections has become paramount. As my practice progressed and we became more engaged in academic activity and we started to get students and residents from Memorial University actually on site with us, uh, they actually were very, uh, sort of a very important arbiter in ensuring that we gave significant thought to the use of antibiotics. They would question me. Uh, they would ensure that I had a reasonable rationale for prescribing what I was prescribing, that it wasn't the habitual, uh, by the way, you gave me a course of azithromycin the last time, and I'm ready to sign up again. <laughs> it was like, show us the evidence, please, doctor. So I think the Academic approach was uh, was particularly beneficial in that regard. So oh, interesting. Um, so you spoke about the rural versus urban divide, which is very interesting. And a sort of follow up question then, and taking that into account, what what tools did you rely upon, particularly for patients with the with these very complex resistant infections, and, and just your perspective um, from rural versus urban, and and how and how we bridge that bridge that divide. So I think that was, uh, you know, it's every physician's nightmare that if you have a patient, and particularly with our aging demographic, we see this more and more, 
uh, individuals will present to you with all the clinical hallmarks of sepsis. So the initial response is to provide empiric therapy with a broad spectrum antibiotic, mm -hmm. and then utilize what resources you have on the ground. So baseline laboratory test, testing, a chest X-ray, uh, urine culture, etc. But many of these investigations have to then be sent to a secondary lab for processing, and uh, you know this results in delays. So it was kind of a combination of clinical management, the use of localized testing, but in individuals who were unstable, uh, expedient transfer was necessary to a secondary or tertiary care center where they could have more advanced diagnostics and therapeutics applied. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. And and did you find um, barriers to treatment in your in your practice? And and did this evolve over time as well? I mean, you spoke a, a little bit about that, but you know, did you see these barriers and did it evolve over time in your practice? I think the critical barriers were always, uh, you know, uh, going back to a, a resource issue, the availability of testing. Uh, you know, in the in the recent past, fortunately, uh, I've witnessed. Uh, an increased availability of point of care testing, uh, which has uh, increased the ability of physicians to respond in a more judicious and appropriate manner with respect to the use of antibiotics. But this continues to remain uh, a, a crucial issue. Yeah. It, it's primarily a resource issue. Uh, the other factor that kind of comes into play as well in rural communities is we often have a rapid turnover of health professionals. And uh, and this this can lead to again that old adage of do no harm, take the path of least resistance. Here, take a course of antibiotics, even when it, where it may not be applicable. Yeah, and sometimes we talk about now about um, do no harm being a double edged coin in some cases because do no harm it's you have uh, what's needed for the patient and also this broader societal impact too. And so it's 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 always such a challenge. Um, so I was so impressed to see all the all the forums that you participate in in terms of the global level. Um, you know, you're you're involved in numerous multilateral and bilateral uh, parliamentary associations. And when it comes to the AMR issue, there's been a lot of discussion at the global forum level. So there's the G7, G20. There's going to be a special session on AMR at the UN General Assembly in 2024. And, and so there, there is a lot happening, which is great. Uh, so what, what do you, um, what do you believe are the, you know, why, why global cooperation is needed um, from your perspective and, and your, your vantage point from the work that you're doing um, in the Senate? Where, where are those opportunities? So I think this is crucial. Uh, my involvement with uh, connections at the World Health, uh, working with the Global Forum, and then as well as the Interparliamentary Union, has afforded me an opportunity to dialogue with experts and practitioners from across the globe, particularly those from uh, the Global South and uh, developing nations. And, you know, WHO recognizes that AMR is one of the top 10 global public health threats. And this is a point that comes up repeatedly, uh, the fact that AMR has no boundaries or borders and that a collaborative approach is so crucial in effective prevention in the long term. So I've made every effort to leverage these international platforms to share knowledge, resources and best practices uh, to develop uh, and implement comprehensive strategies. And it kind of falls into several categories. Uh, probably the most important is improving awareness. Yep. So that educational component, both from the public's perspective, as well as at the medical school and practicing physician level, critical. Mm -hmm. Strengthening our knowledge through surveillance and research, including data collection. So even in Canada, uh, in my rural practice, I was uh, in retrospect surprised at how poorly we did at keeping continuous tracks of data and following these up. Uh, a good lesson came from influenza tracking, for example. Uh, that will always be helpful when we knew which strains were kind of circulating in our community and, uh, you know, how vigilant we had to be in terms of primary prevention. 
optimizing the use of antibiotics, recognizing that, you know, very few new antibiotics have come on into the marketplace, uh, that for big pharma, it's not necessarily a practical investment. And the fact that we also have uh, antibiotics being distributed worldwide, uh, often without the level of quality control that they should receive. And I'll just give you an example. I was visiting family in Malawi and my nephew had a flu-like illness and he was able to go to the corner store and pick up a course of tetracycline mm -hmm. that had been manufactured abroad. And I was like, well, aren't you going to see a doctor? Like, uh, what's the rationale behind this? And his approach was, well, when uh, I get these symptoms, I'll often just go and pick up an antibiotic and I feel a whole lot better in a couple of days. And we had a discussion about self-limiting and, and, and how inappropriate, in a sense, this was, because when you really needed a course, uh, that it may not be effective. And then, you know, uh, I mean, we live in, an, in a fascinating era of advances in technology and AI in particular. So uh, maintaining sustainable investments in new medications, uh, diagnostic tools, particularly point of care, where I know in rural Australia, they've had gr a great deal of success. Mm -hmm. uh, fighting the barriers that are coming up against vaccination. I mean, we're beginning to see these measles outbreaks and the secondary infections that arise. And then, uh, you know, wider digital connectivity. That's a great list. I think that, I think these are really important considerations, both as, as Canada looks to implement our, our pancane action plan, but as you said, um, there, there are no borders here. And so there, it's so important as we look to these strategies about how they are implementable in um, LMICs as well and our, and our responsibility in that regard. Um, and so this is actually bridging it in, there's, there's a global and then there's, there's your work with the um, Parliamentary Health Research Caucus. So, so what, what do you think the opportunities are for, for parliamentarians to work together uh, to, to really you know, focus on these strategies for Canada, but also how we can be leaders in Canada for other countries to follow as well? So I think this particular forum uh, has been a, a, a real blessing for me in the ability for me to bring my medical skills to a broader array of parliamentarians. We are fortunate in, in that we have six physicians currently sitting in the Senate chamber. So we collaborate and work very closely. And the Health Research Caucus has undoubtedly placed AMR as one of its priority issues. We've had a couple of sessions and we will continue to follow up. I think the important thing of this research caucus is that it engages elected officials as well as policymakers and key industry stakeholders. And together we advocate for long-term sustainable health research funding that spurs innovation and, and ensures that Canadian citizens are amongst the healthiest in the world. We're able to promote policies that align with global strategies and contribute to fighting against AMR on both you know, the provincial, national, and international levels. We've been fortunate enough to have presenters uh, that are recognized uh, experts in infectious diseases, uh, but also individuals who are doing cutting edge research and uh, affording us a look at uh, the technological interface of tomorrow. That's wonderful. Well, we're so we're so grateful for your leadership and and leadership of this committee. Um, because as I mentioned at the top, uh, with this AMR issue, we we can have medical advancements, but we have some significant uh, barriers that need to be addressed, and and we need we need leaders to um, really support these solutions with respect to public policy uh, funding and whatnot. So um, we're so grateful for the work of the committee and, and your leadership there. No, um, thank you very much, and I should acknowledge. Uh, you know, some of the uh, leaders from the House of Commons that I work closely with. Uh, there's mm -hmm. Dr. Helena Jazek, herself a physician, who is the chair of the group, and the vice chair, the Dr. Stephen Ellis, a physician from Nova Scotia, and Ms. Carol Hughes, uh, who has a very long and very vibrant relationship with the Health Research Caucus. Well, that's, thank you for acknowledging. Uh, thank you for acknowledging that. It's important for our listeners to know. And and these are these are um, you know our elected leaders also that we can continue to work with um, on raising these important issues um, that are so critical both for Canada and the world. 
Um, so, so going back to then just a little bit more of the local level. So we have the Pan-Canadian Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance that came out this summer. And um, this really puts forward a five-year blueprint for addressing AMR um, with federal, provincial, and territorial governments working together. As you can appreciate, you understand the importance of, of, of the local, provincial, and, and the national level in, in looking at addressing AMR. And so can you provide your perspective from the provincial um, provincial side in Newfoundland and, and how we can you know, translate, if there are any of our best practices or, or shining light examples in Newfoundland that we can share um, with other parts of the country? Uh, because sometimes we find that in Canada, if we have leadership at some at one province, it can really inspire um, adoption in other provinces. Yeah, so uh, again, I, I'll point out that in Newfoundland and Labrador, Dr. Peter Daly, who is an infectious disease specialist at the health sciences, has really led the charge on this uh, in, in developing educational programs in working closely with physician groups as well as multidisciplinary teams in including key players within the health uh, team, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, nurses, uh, public health physicians, and overall, historically, we've been very, very successful in our vaccine programs. Uh, it's a program that has been essentially run by public health. And our childhood uptake of vaccines is 95% plus with very, very close and vigilant follow-up. So successes in surveillance and now with education and policy implementation, the lessons learned from COVID, I think have all kind of put us front and center recognizing that this is a crucial problem. Historically, unfortunately, uh, we were the largest prescribers of antibiotics in Canada. Eastern Canada, by far, ahead of the rest of uh, the country, and Newfoundland and Labrador topping all of that. So, you know, this team-based approach to care has, in particular, addressed the inappropriate use of antibiotics in long-term care uh, and mild infections. Uh, educational initiatives through public health nurses in particular uh, for the broader community. A, a, a piece that was particularly useful for me was the audit feedback to providers. So you would get uh, quarterly information on your prescribing habits for common infections as opposed to your peer group. And if, you know, I felt I was over and above in prescribing amoxicillin for upper respiratory tract infections compared to my colleagues, it really kind of made you want to think about what you were doing. And it was sort of, in a sense, coming directly at you. And 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 in, even talking to colleagues, it made a huge difference. Of course, uh, the rural-urban divide and, and the fact that uh, remote parts of uh, our province still remain vulnerable to overuse is an area that's being addressed. Uh, education for uh, new Canadians is a critical piece as well. Uh, and again, not, this is not meant to be in any way denigrating, but generally the demand from some of our immigrant causes for antibiotics is higher than the Canadian population that have been living here for a long time. Uh, virtual care has proved to be extremely useful in some respects. And I think particularly in sort of say complex skin infections where I could co consult a dermatologist. But we also know that the prescribing of antibiotics through virtual care is much higher than in person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then overall, I think the lessons from COVID were particularly valuable to us. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's great to, uh, there, there's, there's so much there. And I, I really like your point about public health nurses as well, because we, we look we look to, you know, our, our frontline health professionals and how we all need to be um, working together. And it's important to note that, um, especially when you're talking also about education um, and, and the groups to work with and just the, the proactive role that they played in vaccination, how that can apply here. And also Absolutely. the audit too. I mean, oh, sorry, I was just saying audit. Uh, it's, it's a low cost way um, to, to promote um, uh, it was, uh, stewardship. Yeah, and I and, and I I do in particular want to uh, compliment our pharmacy colleagues. Uh, more and more, we're including pharmacists in our multidisciplinary teams. Uh, I can recall having pharmacy students 
uh, shadowing and doing electives with me. And it was incredible to see the work they did in terms of, you know, patients taking numerous medications, uh, long-term prophylaxis of antibiotics being inappropriate in some instances and so on. So to have someone with that level of training and discretion and knowledge uh, really made it so valuable to have them, uh, you know, kind of become important stewards of antimicrobial resistance. Yes. Well, as a, as a daughter of a pharmacist, I can say that uh, pharmacists play a very <laughs> important role. And and yeah. I know that when we talk to hospital pharmacists, this is something that is really top of mind for them. And they do they do value the collaboration um, with their with their ID physicians and with the labs. And so it's 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 really critical, important. And I'm glad you brought it up in the community as well. Um, you know, the role for community pharmacists um, to play. So that's that's great. Thank you. Um, and actually, this is a good bridge to the next conversation. You talked about at the beginning, I thought it was so fascinating about your students. And, and over time, you, you saw them becoming more involved and in saying, well, you know, do you need that? Do you, do you need that? And so it, when it comes to um, at, in the university and the work that you have done there um, and, and on the topic of antimicrobial stewardship, where do you, where do you think the opportunities are? are um one you know is it is it in is it innovation is it education um data you know all of the above just wanted to get your perspective from the setting yeah. of uh, of, the, of the university so i think i think it's a it's a combination of these factors so you know at the outset of my practice i sort of in a group physician practice with time the educational component came in and then we had students at different levels of training we are fortunate enough then as well to develop a nurse practitioner program, which proved to be particularly valuable. So, and, and then engaging with the School of Pharmacy and our community pharmacists on a very high level. So at the end of the day, I think one of the key elements for us in a rural community uh, with respect to stewardship was this collaborative multidisciplinary approach makes a huge difference. Innovations in technology are absolutely critical. So I feel point of care testing, rapid testing, for example, a rapid strep test can be so valuable uh, in terms of treating or not treating. Do you take the watch and wait approach or, okay, you definitely have the condition, here's your course of treatment. Enhancing uh, technology in rural areas as well, particularly as we alluded to earlier, uh, the availability of uh, ready specialist access through uh, virtual care I think uh, makes a huge difference. And then the ongoing data collection. So you're able to compare uh, apples to apples and you're able to see if your you know, audit process shows a disproportionate or inappropriate use of the resources in that setting. So I think embracing these innovative technologies, collaboration and shared data uh, in the long term will make a huge difference in terms of our approach to AMR stewardship. And I think the lessons we learn in Canada, but equally from some of our partner countries that have a similar geography, Australia comes to mind repeatedly because they have a particularly advanced primary care uh, model of practice uh, can be very, very useful, I think. There's there's so much there. It's such great insights. Um, I love the idea, but you know, in rural settings, the importance of collaboration and multidisciplinary, um, the rapid stress test. There's so much good stuff there. So thank you so much. Um, you've taught us you taught us a lot in this podcast, and we I I do, I do find with sometimes with AMR, it it can it can it's it's an issue that's getting more and more complicated, more and more difficult. It, it, it can be negative sometimes. So we try to end on a, on a positive note um, that we can share with our listeners. And when we look at, let's say, what's ahead for Canada, we look now, we have the Pan-Canadian Action Plan for AMR. We have this five-year time frame. Um, what, what, do you think, what do you think the opportunities are where, where Canada can look forward and, and look forward for success and, and where we can be going? Okay, so my, <laughs> my final summary uh, statement is that I think Successful implementation of uh, Canada's commitments as a country does hold great promise. Uh, practitioners can anticipate ongoing strength in surveillance, improved antibiotic stewardship, and enhanced collaboration across healthcare sectors. This, coupled with continued research and innovation, I think can pave the way for a more resilient and sustainable healthcare system. 
better equipped to combat AMR in the long term and the willingness to embrace technology, which is evolving so rapidly, I think is a crucial part of this. That's great. Well, I think that I think that the AMR action plan gives us a great framework to move forward on. And with leaders such as you uh, representing Canada, um, both here and, and internationally, we're just so grateful for your leadership and your support. Uh, you've given us a lot of ideas, actually, that can support the implementation of the Pan-Canadian Action Plan. And we look forward to working with you um, in the months and years ahead uh, for the for the thank betterment you. of Canadians. No, and thank you very much to you and your team for all the work that you do. This is an absolute pleasure. I hope we can continue with this dialogue and collaboration. And thank you to all of our listeners. Thank you so much.